We are now recording. Okay. So one of the questions that we have that I think we're looking for uh, some help from Jessica with is what the different, whether or not there is, like we have one kind of SBOM that's currently in Augur that I think you've seen the link for and also gave us some really helpful feedback on how to put back all of the things you like about the old version of Augur <laughs> on the Augur meeting last week. Um, but, but we're wondering, like there is a, there is a complete SPDX compliant SBOM that could also be delivered, I think. And the question I think that we have is where does that sit in terms of a priority or how would you want the SBOM defined? And Matt, maybe you, Matt German Prey, maybe you can clarify a little bit what I'm trying desperately to communicate. Well, I think you said it all right. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Jessica. <laughs> Um, let me, let me think, say what I think you're saying, and then you can tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. Um, so in the, the S that gets generated by the Augur tool currently, you are asking one, if that is sufficient, if it needs more information and if it needs more information, what that, what form that information needs to take. So we know it's not a complete S bomb as it's defined by SPDX. And, okay. Uh, Maybe um, Matt Snell, are you in a position to share a copy of what the SBOM currently is or in, in its current form? Otherwise, I could probably go in and do it. Why don't you do it, Sean? I think okay. Matt might be having some technical difficulties. Okay. Um, and then we had it on the Zephyr instance. You just get there. Okay, yes, I got there. Yay. Um, share. So what what the, you've seen this <laughs> you've probably seen this risk page. The fourth count by week is just low because something hasn't been run against this database yet. But the download what we have now is this download software bill of materials. And it's in yeah. a standard data exchange format called JSON. So uh, okay, I guess I guess download that, which causes me to download it. And then if I open, hopefully, uh, sorry, all right, it didn't open it with the tool. I, I wanted to just open it in Chrome, so. Well, let me, I, what, here's what I'll say for the moment. Um, you have very bravely wandered into a very contentious debate at the moment with uh, trying to format an SBOM. <laughs> um, because the, the process that Kate is involved in at the National Telecommunications Infrastructure Agency or administration, yeah. whatever the A stands for, yeah. um, people who's in a very, not insignificant amount of time has been dedicated to this question over the last year and a half ish still can't agree on what an S bomb should look like. Okay. Um, and so I, I will say this, um, one of the big concerns about S bomb for a lot of the people who are in that conversation or just generally is they don't know how to generate one. They don't, they don't even know. They're not to the point necessarily of asking what it looks like or having opinions on what it should or shouldn't look like. Right. They just can't, they can't even have that conversation yet because they don't know how they're supposed to make one. And so I, I will, I'll say this, with having a tool like this, like Augur that will just pop up in SBOM, I yeah. think is such a leap forward for most people that, I mean, whatever you give them at this point, I'm fine with because I expect what will end up happening is that you will have feedback and you'll have people who are like, oh, this is really great. Can't, what, about, what about this? Can we do this? Can we do this? So, so. Thank you. That's good. To, that's good to hear. And I, I do understand those kinds of conversations. People are, I tell my software engineering students this all the time, people are terrible at expressing what they want without, mm -hmm. without an example. And yeah. so with design, you can 
work up examples with on paper and start to do things. I think what we have right now, I think we're pretty confident isn't quite enough. Uh, it includes some basic package assertion information, um, license coverage, things like that, and the, the enumeration of all of the licenses that Nomos detects in the scan. What it doesn't include is a listing of, for example, I believe the full S bomb includes an, a, a listing of all the files. Is that right, Matt? German prayer, Schnell? Relationships yeah. and file by file. Um, right. Like breakdowns of every file. So if you click on licenses right now, Sean, right. show me. It shows you only the license data and the license name. I don't so know what extracted text means. But, but it looks it like you, it doesn't show you what file it's associated with. Correct. It just tells you that these are the licenses that were detected in this package. So there isn't okay. any more that all right. So right now, all it is is really, and that's not a criticism. That's now. Right now, it's it's only the license information. And before we proceeded to start to add other things that are part of the SPDX spec, we thought we should talk it through in this meeting. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I, okay. I get, I'm a little bit more clear. I think of where you're coming from. Um, so the two, two things on the licenses declared part, I think I wouldn't worry so much about this because I think for the licenses declared from a legal perspective for a lot of these folks, it's going to be, does this have a, you know, one of the types of licenses that I know I can't use because that license has restrictions that I don't want. Where and so if they can up higher, and that's it's like, um, well, I think the what I'm showing is the listing of licenses. But Jessica, you had mentioned licenses declared. Was that just overall on that long license list? Um, so I'm looking are, at this. So there are files. Are on screen. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Sorry, the text really small. <laughs> uh, let me see. If I can make it bigger. I have the technology. <laughs> Um, so, so essentially the licenses are below, like there's an enumeration of every license that's in it below the screen. So like there's a GPL, uh, dual license, public, I don't know what license or public domain is, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, license ref C files, CR, I don't, I don't know exactly what all these, like obviously BSD is, I know what that is. So, so often, can, yeah. Sorry. Um, can you go back to the like the the home page? I'm gonna keep calling that until somebody gives me a different name. For for Augur? Yeah. For Zephyr. For the Zephyr page. All right. Yes. I'll bring it up. Yes. yes. And this is the page where after the <laughs> Augur discussion, I know there are some updates the team has made, but I haven't pulled to the Zephyr instance yet. Okay, excellent. And this takes a little bit of a minute to pop up, but there it goes. Ooh. Um, we'll click but, on, or do you want to see this? I was going to look at the light, because there's a, there's a box somewhere that essentially oh. will list out. The list. Yes, it's the risk page list. Yeah. Out. Yes. Okay. So this so like, is, I know, um, what one of these is, which one's the problematic one? Like people don't like, GPL is often no G, oh, okay. GPL is often three and sometimes a Faro GPL. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think what it, again, like if I was, um, let's say we actually have a very competent open source office at one of these companies, and they have, you know, a savvy lawyer who said like, here's the list of okay licenses and not okay licenses. I can essentially take my list of organizations acceptable and not acceptable licenses and go check them against the li this license declared box. If I want to use a package and I know that I can't use GPL 2.0 and it, you know, this says that G it doesn't on here, but for the sake of argument, it says that GPL 2.0 was found. I know I have a problem. Yes. Yeah, it becomes like that. Yeah. yeah. It becomes almost like that checklist thing. Yep. Right. And so perhaps then if, if we move forward from there, a next step would be making letting you know which parts of this system have that license in it. That would be excellent because then it might be something where you might be able to, I don't know if this is actually possible, but carve that out or replace it somehow. I don't know, however it would work, but yeah, that would be, that would be excellent. 
I think there are ways that people do that all the time. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, Phasology does that as a tool. So like in Phasology, it's just a license scanner, Jessica. So Phasology doesn't give oh, you- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know oh, Phasology, yep. All right. So you could in, in Phasology, like see that Apache 2.0 in that short name there and the license mm -hmm. is declared. Like you could in, 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 in essence, click it and then see all the files that contain that. Like, so you could drill down. Yeah. If you, if you were using the Phasology tool, are you saying yeah. for, for, okay. Yep. Just in the Phasology tool. So that just gives you a little bit more transparency. We're trying to, on any of these tools, we're trying to provide enough information that's useful and not too much that is overwhelming. Yeah. Well, I think, and this might not actually be what's happening. So tell me if I'm wrong, but it almost seems like what I'm seeing you all do is take several of the different tools that I know are in existence, Phasology, Facade, and some others that I'm sure exist, SVDX, I assume is in there somewhere, um, and sort of step up one level and create these contexts around all of them, which is fantastic because I got to tell you, I've described some of these tools to the folks that I work with on um, like the global product security officers and they like the idea of the tools. They do not like the idea of the amount of time it would take them to learn the tools and then to deploy them. Yes. So this kind of thing cuts a lot of that out. The screen that you're looking at has Phasology, it has SPDX, it has uh, the CII best practices stuff. It has right. GitHub data all kind of brought it, together in one place. And it's actually the facade that we're using to clone the repos that we're scanning here. So there's a facade is part of this as well. So you are correct. It is like five different things all brought <laughs> together. Which is fantastic. Um, this is, this is really, I mean, this is really what I, what I, sort of envision that this was going to turn into and this is exactly what I think people want <laughs> for for a whole host of reasons um including the software bill of materials part which is that you know if they if they know that they're going to have to use a, a certain package and they know that not only when they <laughs> plug one of these packets one of these repositories into the auger tool they're going to get not only a software bill of materials but all this other information I mean as long as we can contextualize this properly and, and publicize it properly, I, I do think that this is going to become a tool that, that folks are really going to want to leverage. So kudos to all of you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, and kudos to uh, Matt Snell is the one that's really kind of taken the DUSOX scanners and put it into a page that integrates it with the other things that we're doing. And um, I think one question from a, a, a I guess sort of a tooling. So one of the things we're doing is we're taking some of the metrics that we're providing that are in the tool that aren't yet defined in the next metrics release for risk. I think another question we have is, and this is where Matt Snell, I, I don't know, maybe you can use chat, but I think it would be helpful to, to know like what's, what's the level of, so it sounds like it would be cool if we could click on a license and see a list of the parts of the program or the files in the, in the, in the program or the package that include that license. Um, yeah. I'm reasonably confident that's in the database. Um, Matt Snell, can you confirm that my reasonable certainty has any merit? We've actually got another pull request doing something else with the license declared right now. Um, okay. we, we'll link to TLDR legal um, oh. for the license itself. Excellent. Um, and as far as finding out what relations the um, like what file they're found in, I'm pretty sure there's a column that just tells you what file it was found in uh, and we can go off of just that and do like all kinds of information kind of scraping um, and tell you where what where this license is kind of found but I don't know quite the best way to implement that um, if, I, if I understand what you're saying I liked Matt's idea of like if I click if I, if there were files that had Apache 2.0, if I could click Apache and it gave me a drop down that said, you know, here's, here's the five or six packages that use Apache 2.0, something as simple as that, I think would be very useful. Well, I think, I think in some of these, um, in some, my guess is many of these, like something like Zephyr includes thousands of, fi of files. Mm -hmm. So, um, like in some cases, a drop down, it's probably. Yeah. 
not going to work as well, but uh, a, a downloadable list is possible. It's also possible that the information, and I'm just sort of discussing design possibilities, and that Snell can uh, address feasibility or what's optimal, but one possibility is that you would just download a list of the files where it's included so that you could see that. And it, it oh, interesting. Um, okay, yeah. and that maybe that list is uh, structured by directory. So it becomes fairly clear if there's a particular directory, uh, which is often the case that contains files with that license. Um, I find that, that when you have multiple licenses declared, often it's one piece of the whole program that has a hundred, hundreds or maybe a dozen dozen to a dozen to thousands of files that contain that license declaration. And they're usually under one part of the system, not like peppered throughout it. Um, okay. So yeah, that is possible. The data is there. So Jessica, when you're looking at this box, what I think is uh, under a short name where it says all the lists, somehow getting you the list of the files that contain, say, BSD, that whether mm -hmm. it's downloadable or another page or whatever it might be. Um, and then see the column that says note? Yeah. So Matt, is this where you were putting the TLDR legal under that column or was it on the? I was just list? putting it under the short name column uh, where they, like you could just click on the license itself and it would just take you to the page for the license. Okay, so maybe Explains we could it. do that and then under note we could say click here to see files. So basically. Oh yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, Matt has included, are, are you familiar with TRDL, TLDR legal? Yep. So the idea would be is you could click on Apache 2.0, it'll actually take you to the TLDR page to give you a little information if you'd like it. Mm -hmm. And then under note, that could be where it says, you know, click here to see all files that contain this license. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah, and, and uh, it sounds like, like the way I would do it, Matt, is I would, I would look at all the files and then maybe at the top, I would show a listing of the top level directory where those files are found within the package. Because that, I mean, you can probably, people can figure that out by looking at it, but if you have a list of thousands of files, it would be helpful to know what, what, what top level subdirectory the licenses are, that license is found in, as well as the full enumeration of files that have it. Does well, that? There's, um, there's a person I participated in their study um, that I think for their terminal study, there were, or their thesis, they were looking at um, tree views for licenses in a repository, Ooh. which I thought was pretty interesting and might be relevant to this. That's extremely relevant to this, I think. That, yeah, sounds like it to me, if that was a question so, somewhat directed in my way. I, that's, I a, that's a lead, and I can just follow that, talk to that person, see what they did to do that, and then you know, we'll work on implementing that. That would be helpful. And I can... Um, uh, I can pull the latest version and Matt's pull request and stuff uh, so that we have an updated version of Augur soon. Okay. I'm taking notes, by the way. Thank you. So I had um, three quick just points that I wanted to ask on or hit. Um, the census two results. Um, the uh, ha oh, I have those. I have those uh, scanning, and I should go. Uh, how brave is how brave is Sean today? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't looked at this um, since I started to things up after I emailed you the other day, so there shouldn't be any insights. There should be repos, and oh. looks, like, looks like we have commit counts and some issue counts. In the cases where there aren't issue counts, it's, uh, I will check on the back end uh, to see if that's because it's not done counting or because those repositories simply aren't using GitHub issues. Okay. Um, but if I, let's, let's just go be brave one more time. So 
So this to me looks like facade hasn't actually finished yet, or there's only one contributor on the one that I guessed, which seems unlikely. Do you, do you know, um, just for giggles, do you know if Lod like on the list, the full list that you have, if Lodash is, has finished? Uh, Actually, fuck it. Do you see books? Oh, God, I'm swearing on something that's getting. Hi. I, <laughs> I, uh, <that's> right. <laughs> I'm going to have to look at the back. I wish John that said that. That wasn't just. <laughs> so, so Lodash does. It, so it looks like that first repository I clicked on may, in fact, only have that one contributor. That's interesting. Uh, um, or something broke. Uh, and so I need to go look. Who I, is. I, the guy with the brown, John. David Dalton. David. Gino. Okay, wow, he's um, but there's, prolific. There's <laughs> uh, I see. Oh, okay. so I, I think that yes, this needs to be more clear because these look like it, it's actually year month, but it looks like only when I'm reading it. My first impression is that it's like seven days in January or nine days in January that we're looking at. That's and many that, years. Yeah. That's years, so uh, it, I don't think that's very clear. Um, but okay, this is—I mean, this is already. I'm excited because <laughs> Lodash um, was a, was our number one. So um, this is this is interesting. Can I see the risk tab? Uh, yeah. I don't think I've run risk on these yet. Matt okay. Matt Snell gave me instructions on how to do that, and I didn't do it yet. Last Friday was my birthday, and I did take a little bit of time off after starting the scan. And I am happy to hear that. So, so no apologies necessary. But I will go get that connected up here this afternoon. Um, okay. And I'll um, double check on you... what's going on. I'll just, I'll, I'll just double check that the facade completed successfully and that that one weird repo that we were looking at at the very beginning, um, in fact, just has that, and I forget which one it was now, but. I'll just make sure everything finished correctly in facade. Okay. It looks it looks like it did, or else we wouldn't be seeing those commit totals for anything. Hey um, Jessica, I am recording this. Do you want me to not include? No, you're fine. Don't thought. worry about it. I just want to make sure. <laughs> I appreciate but, it, but <laughs> not, not not for your swear word, mostly just for the data. <laughs> yeah. No, I I get it, but I think we're all right. Um, okay. Yeah. Nice okay. Well, just whenever the whenever they're ready. Um, yeah. we are eager to see them and go through them. Um, back on the, just the general, yes. Um, on the question on the SBOM sufficiency for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. the one thing I will say about SBOM, um, that everyone sort of agrees is a minimum, minimum necessary is the list of packages that a given package includes. So it's list of dependencies. Um, so to the extent that that is not currently in the SBOM capability, that would be nice. I will say um, I wouldn't I wouldn't make it the top priority if it's going to be a huge time suck, because I think there there are other projects that are looking at creating that are looking at doing SBOM stuff specifically, and I think it um, the chaos project doesn't need to become subsumed into the SBOM conversation if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it does. Um, the re can you repeat the request because I is to include yeah. So, so yeah. if we, if we... I don't I don't know how it works, Matt Snell. Do you, do you know if, if the import? I think you're you're asking about fi libraries that are imported, right? Well, I'm saying so. Let's say um, I don't actually know that any of this is true, but if we did it for Lo if I plugged in Lodash and was going to get the software materials for Lodash. And let's say this is probably not accurate in the slightest, but we know Lodash includes jQuery, um, Bootstrap, Webpack, and some other things. Am I going to be able to look at the file that gets downloaded and see Bootstrap, Webpack, jQuery somewhere? I can imagine it'd be a lot like a git ignore where you single out certain types of um, importing those and types of directories and names, and you just single them out by that and figure out what kind of node modules you have, um, things like that. 
Or do you mean specifically importing things just for use in your program? Um, I mean for visibility's sake. So one of the when we talk about software bill of materials at a high level, um, for a lot of folks, what they're usually talking about is when they are sold a product, like a software product, they don't normally know they, they know that they're buying product X, but they don't know what product X is built out of. And so they want to know what it is. And so the, so the question for me would be, does this SBOM capability built into the Augur tool, if I feed it product X, is it going to tell me what product X is built out of? Um, That's possible. That doesn't happen right now. Um, right. It, I think it'd be as easy as picking out the patterns that they follow and importing those and then checking for those patterns. So how, it's possible. How, how are imported libraries uh, treated with regards to licensing? And there's a question for Matt German Prey probably. Um, because I don't think the scanner, so the scan, it sounds like the scanner doesn't pull out all the import statements explicitly. And I'm just curious about, I don't know enough about how import statements are treated in terms of what the licenses underlying a package are. Uh, so if I just do an import like something, in, in, like I do import sci-fi um, for statistical analysis. Uh, that's a Python library that gets loaded in the local environment. It's not part of what I'm distributing. It's just part of the environment that the program runs in. Is that considered a licensing thing or a dependency thing or both? Um, it will maybe both. Okay. So I just, it's um, kind of depends on how it's brought in. Mm -hmm. So if it's an imports, I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. I think, I think, um, who, Jessica, maybe you could help us find out how, and, and SciPy is a really good example. There's a popular machine learning um, Python library called SciPy, and it's imported in a lot of Python programs, but okay. it's not, it's not, so it's not, it's not distributed with the software. Um, when you build a piece of software, it downs it downloads SciPy into that Python environment, and the software me... uses functions from SciPy that exist in the environment, but not in the distributed software. But well, before before you like, I think go down that road. Yeah, there are so many like cases of different programming languages that bring in external source in different ways. Mm -hmm. So true. like the example that you provide, right? That's one way. And then different licenses trigger based on those different ways of importing. Mm -hmm. So there are just so many potential cases. That's why I didn't answer this really squarely. Right. That's all that you're kind of always one case away from breaking situation here. Yeah. So it's a bit of a, it's a sticky wicket because it of the, is. Um, so so, and and this might be where I return to the to the point about um, I don't I don't want you all to to get sucked into the chaos. <laughs> I didn't huh. actually mean that to be punny. Um, <laughs> that is the the actual like the S bomb effort at NTIA. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I, something's going to end up coming out of that, some kind of definition, and, and they're probably going to end up talking about a lot of the questions that you all are talking about right now of, um, you know, do, do we include, is, is a package that gets pulled in not when the software is initially given to the, the person who's buying it, but it gets pulled in when they build it on their system, is that technically, does that technically need to be part of the SBOM? Yeah, like that's that's a question that they're going to end up debating. I don't know that um, it's necessary for you all to take that on right now. Okay. Um, it is on the Augur roadmap to include functionality similar to what Libraries.io provides, which is aimed at understanding software dependencies and upstream and downstream dependencies, and that is uh, those are cases where it's basically scanning for the import statements and the number of places that a package is used in other packages. Yeah, I absolutely, I think it'll be great to have it. Um, and I think the more functionality is included 
honestly, the better because um, I think SBOM is going to end up becoming one of those mission creep types of tools where people sort of start using it for one purpose and then it becomes useful for a number of other purposes and it will evolve as um, people become, people start to understand it better. But um, I, I think, I just, I think that the, the metrics that are built around it are so important that I want to make sure that um, the metrics themselves get really well developed so that we have the capability, you know, sort of like we were talking about a few minutes ago of um, being able to contextualize a lot of these tools for people who frankly wouldn't use the tools if there wasn't something like this to help them simplify it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I, I think, so I think the next level for SBOM is the list of files where each of these licenses are included within a package. I think that sounds like the next thing that we would either add to the SBOM at the bottom or add, add as a link in the note as Matt described or do both. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. What do you think, Matt, Jerome, and Trey? Should we do both, like include it in the full SBOM and provide a list with a link or? Um, in terms of the files? Yeah, so if, in terms of the listing of files, if I wanted to see just a list of files that had GPL2, mm -hmm. I could click, I, just, I think the suggestion was I could click on a link here and, and either have a page open up or download that list of files, which might be very long. Yeah, we could that, also, the, long, the longness is not our problem. Right. So, and, and so that, the question, the length. Right. And so the question is, do we include both that yeah. and the, put it in the SBOM or, because it seems like if we can create the link, uh, creating an SBOM that enumerates just all the files is also probably. Honestly, I just put it in the SBOM itself. That's kind okay. of following along the lines of how SPDX rolls. Okay. Because they just drop everything down at the bottom. And so would we provide a, I think, I think that that, would that I, necessarily provide a way that would easily show me just the files that contain a particular license? No, so I would put it in the SBOM and I would probably just have a link under note, like okay. where it says bound by nomos. Okay, that was my question. Yeah, this says show me all the files that contain this license and it would just be another page. Okay. Matt Snell, does that make sense? That makes sense to me. Okay. okay. And I will, um, I'll go take a look at your pull request shortly after this call. Okay. Um, I do have something I want to talk about real quickly. Yeah. So I'll stop sharing the screen now. We, for the next release of risk metrics, mm -hmm. I think we need to have at least a couple. Yeah, we propose to bring forward, and I think one very obvious one is CII. Yes, that was actually not part of. Yeah, because we we've, we've answered those. We had we were not we were basically wanting to not harm that program by putting a, a chaos metric about it without talking with David Wheeler first. So, I think that's pretty easy for us to put yep. to, to write that up. So I think um, that we need a kind of an action item for somebody to start that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other is the code complexity, maybe. Yes. And that, yes. I can start yeah. on CII. If you could do that, Matt, that would be great. And I could start on code complexity. Yeah, so it's just in the repo, Matt. So the, just so you know, the there is a, we do, we can use that tool I've been using manually upon request so far, but Parth is building a worker for, to do, uh, for the complexity. It provides a Kokomo based complexity score for each file in a repository. Okay. And so you could do a, you know, like some kind of mean or average, and I could give you like one project's worth of that.
data, just you kind of know what. That'd be helpful. So I know what's exists. right. Yep. Yeah. So I think maybe I'll just propose we start on those two, because I know they're either done <laughs> in the form of CII or kind of in the works in the sense of code complexity. Okay. Um, and actually on a very similar note, I don't know, I think that this was not strictly speaking a risk metric. Mm -hmm. I think it might've already been in um, evolution. God damn it. Not, yes, evolution. evolution. Um, the, cause, so when we started looking at some of the results that we were seeing from the census projects, um, one of the first questions out of everyone's mouth was when was the last time this thing was updated or when was the last time it was touched? And so um, I think that having that somewhere on, again, I'm calling them the home pages, like the, the Augur home page for a given package would also be really great. Yeah, and I think those are, yeah, so there's, I'm going to put. It's implicit in the commit log, right? But just providing the date last touched as a separate piece of information. Did you all see what I put in the chat? I didn't yet. Jessica, did you get that? Yeah, sorry, I'm. I'm opening link. Yeah, yeah, business risk. Yeah, so it's, I think these are what you're talking about is under business risk. Yes. And so things like committers, like basic, you could ask like, when was the last commit done? Mm -hmm. Down up there at the, the committer line. And yeah, you're right. I mean, some of these are certainly in the evolution side of things. This is just kind of a funny thing about the project itself. The chaos project is is where do the metrics sit? Because at certain times they could sit one place and certain times they could sit somewhere else. Right. So like yeah. the number of commits, you could look at it from a perspective of trying to understand how much growth is occurring. And then you could also look at it as how dead is this project? <laughs> Which yeah. <I> right. <laughs> yes, it's right. framing. Yeah, it's just framing. So um anyway. Point well taken. I mean, maybe that's something, Sean, we, I mean, we do have a lot of this coming out of the evolution side of things. Yeah, I, I think, I think we do. I think one of the things that's um, not, yeah, so I have to look at, so I lose track to a certain extent. I don't I'm going to share my screen for a second. Yeah. Um, share. So this is, for Jessica, can you see that? One second. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I've, I've been going through Augur and proposing some kind of UI changes. Okay. And so the screen, see how it says repo evolution page? Yes. Right here. So this is right here up on top. This is the facade stuff. Uh -huh. You can see. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm proposing is, remember all these graphs from, yes. the old, from the old version that you were talking about, that we include those as well below the facade stuff. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And so that would give you kind of, I think, the insights or the, the clarity that you're looking for. Yeah, and, and that some of that, some of these suggestions may be in the push that Gabe made yesterday. And yeah. I tried to download and install at Lambeau Stadium from my phone, <laughs> um, and I'm something I, I think I know what went wrong, but okay. um, but uh, yeah, I was on my phone at a an NFL game trying to install that, and then I spent the rest of the day driving home. So I think if we can just get <laughs> that old view that you're used to, Jessica, into that evolution page, that might solve a lot of the. It might just solve a lot of what you're talking about. Are you yeah. still, Are you still sharing your screen, Matt? Because so. Okay. I wonder why all my, it's, it's like, I've got like full screen exhibitor talking now, whatever Zoom did to me. All right, that's better. So I'm going to have to go, I have another, I have a two o'clock meeting that I'm going to have to yeah. kind of roll for. I think I we're only 142, but I have to prep for it and then walk to it. Yes. Uh, 
Um, well, let me just ask, so did, is that everything that you all needed from me in terms of having missed the last two meetings? Yes. Yeah, that, okay. that, that was really key. That was really great. And I will update you on the census shortly. Perfect. Well, then that was everything that I had for you all. So all right. I think we did quite well. Yeah, we, us too. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye.